<laughs> Great. Uh, nice to see you, Nicholas. Uh, it's good to see you in Helsinki. I think it's been like three years uh, since we last met actually in, uh, in Paris. And I remember at the time, you were just a couple of people just sitting in an office uh, right above us. Uh, and now you're, what, 600 people. You're across uh, 24 countries, work with 100,000 retailers, 30,000 brands. So it's been quite a journey uh, you know, in the short three years. Uh, but first of all, you know, tell us a bit more about Anchor Store. Like, what do you do and what product you provide? Thank you, Thomas. It's uh, great to be here with you. And indeed, thanks for having been with us since the early beginning of this uh, incredible journey at Anchor Store. And so what Anchor Store is about, Anchor Store is a B2B marketplace between brands and retailers. And so what do we do as a business? So as most of marketplaces, obviously, we help brands and retailers connect and transact on our marketplace, but we also go beyond pure transaction. We provide a lot of services to these small businesses across Europe. And the two main services that we provide them are first logistic services. Again, we are talking about small businesses, so they have a lot of needs. And we are active in, as you said, 24 countries across Europe. So it's sometimes very difficult for them to manage these logistic networks. So we in invest a lot in logistics for them. And we also provide payment terms um, to our brands and retailers. Cash is king, especially in current times for our small businesses active on Anchor Store. Mm -hmm. And so we allow um, retailers to pay after 60 days when they buy products on our platform. And brands are paid when the goods are delivered. So we help both sides uh, of the platform with uh, our payment terms. And so the mission of Anchor Store, as you understand, is to really enable these independent retailers to thrive. And the reason why we believe this mission is so important is, uh, uh, you, you know me a little, I am a father of four kids, and I don't want my kids to live in a world where we would all sit on our couch and order everything from Amazon. Um, we are living in Europe. Uh, we know that since many centuries, our European cities are great, are thriving, and it's the same for all our villages. And at Anchor Store, we believe that independent retailers are the blood of these cities. And so we want them to be successful. And in order to be successful, I think in current times, they need great technology, they need great brands, and they need great terms. And so that's what we are about at Anchor Store. So before we, uh, we talk about Anchor Store, let's, uh, let's talk a bit about you first uh, and, and your background. So you, you started in consulting. It's not your first rodeo. You built a business before called a Little Market, which you sold to Etsy. Decide to go at it again. Uh, can you tell us a bit about your path your, to entrepreneurship? What did you learn from consulting? What did you decide to, uh, to start Anchor Store? So indeed, yeah, it's, uh, it's not my first company, and I started my career as a consultant. Um, but the, the journey from consulting to entrepreneurship was, I would say, an easy one, because I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I am a, from a family of entrepreneurs, so this was really in my DNA. Um, but wh 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 where you are right is, I think these are two very different worlds. And so switching from consulting to entrepreneurship, I think I had to de-learn quite a few things that I had actually learned at, uh, at Bain, uh, where, where I was working before. And maybe the two most important things that I had to de-learn is first, as a consultant, you tend to believe that once you have the, the plan, the roadmap, then it's done. I learned the hard way that actually the work is starting once you're here. Mm. And so as, as an entrepreneur, you absolutely need um, to build the operating system of your company to determine how it will execute, how the communication will flow in the company. And this is extremely important. Like having good ideas is not enough. Execution is the key. And so that's the first thing that I learned the hard way making this transition. Mm. And the second thing that I learned the hard way is uh, when you're working for big companies in, in, in consulting, like every single percent that you can gain here and there for your customers are very important. And so you really try to be pixel perfect everywhere for them. Mm. But as an entrepreneur, you have many opportunities everywhere. And so the opposite is true. You need to be very focused. And so I spend my days uh, at Anchor Store still today seeing opportunities everywhere that I could, like op uh, optimization that I could make everywhere. But I'm like, OK, no, this is not the most important thing. I need to be focused on the most important thing. And so what I learned is yeah, not being pixel perfect in the entrepreneurship world, focusing on what really matters and accepting to leave a lot of things uh, not perfect. 
Yeah, actually, doing the work is much uh, much harder. <laughs> Imagine. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so. Um, well, something I got us really excited about Anchor Store is when you think about it, you're actually providing tooling right, to brands and retailers to be more efficient and effectively compete against Amazon. So, can you tell us a bit more about you know, how do you think about competing with Amazon and the big tech companies and how, how do you view that relationship? Um, yes, that's a great question, and indeed, that's my personal, I think, professional mission. I really want to build tools and technology to enable independent businesses. To me, that's one of the most beautiful business models that the internet has created, is this idea of marketplaces. A marketplace is basically allowing you to put together a lot of independent people and like, give them a power that they would not have if they were on their own. So for example, if you think about an independent retailer in Helsinki, of course, it's very difficult for them to get access to the same kind of logistic services, to the same kind of financing services that big companies like Amazon or, or all the big box retailers. But when you put all these independent retailers uh, together, and we have more than 100,000 of them on Anchor Store, they're actually bigger than Amazon in terms of scale. And so we, as a marketplace, we can go to UPS, we can go to DHL, we can go to our financing partners, and we can negotiate great deals for them. And so that's really something that is indeed very exciting to me. And coming back to your question of how do we like, compete with Amazon, actually, our conviction at Anchor Store about retail is that retail will polarize around two segments. One segment is really about the commodities. That's where you want to go when you want to be delivered fast, uh, some cheap products that you need immediately. And here, Amazon is incredible, very difficult to compete with. And we are not playing in this field. We are playing in the other segment of retail, which is to us about the experience. That's where you want to go when you want to have a great experience, when you want to find unique and great products. And this is where we want to play, and this is where we believe independent retailers should play. They should not compete directly with Amazon, they should play on their strengths. And at Anchor Store, we are building the operating system for them, so that they can not only play on a different field, but also have the same kind of logistics, financing, um, software tools that the big box retailers do have. And so that's what we are all about, and we believe that, that everything in the middle in retail will, will struggle. And we already see this happening in a lot of industries. An example that I love is actually in the bookstore industry. So bookstore, we all know, is really where Amazon has started and where Amazon is so strong. And so, for example, in France, um, in the bookstore industry, Amazon is, of course, thriving. But the independent bookstores is the other segment of this market that is thriving. All the actors in the middle are, are struggling, but independent bookstores, it's a double-digit growth in France. So that's, I think, exactly uh, our vision of how retail will evolve in the coming years and why we believe that independent retailers will thrive in an Amazon world um, in the coming years. Okay, great. Um, and talking about marketplaces, so you've started two, uh, two marketplaces and it's, it's notoriously difficult to start a marketplace because you have to build demand and supply at the same time, find liquidity, etc. Uh, and how did you think about you know, starting the marketplace? And when did you think, you know, at that point, I think I have product market fit? Like, what were the signals? So, indeed, a marketplace is, I agree with you, very difficult to start because of this chicken and egg problem. And so, <laughs> this is making your question all, all the more relevant. I think you don't want to start a marketplace if you are not convinced that you are solving a really big problem for at least one size of, of the marketplace. And so, if you are not convinced that you will find very strong product market fit, you should not go. And so, coming back to your question, how did we convince ourselves that we were solving a big issue? Um, so, you were mentioning, I, I, it was my second company, so I, when I left my first company, um, I was looking for new opportunities, and as you know, I wanted to find something meaningful, I wanted to build another marketplace, I wanted to continue to empower independent business owners, but I was like, exploring several opportunities, and one of my former colleagues from Etsy uh, had a lot of experience in wholesale. He had spent 10 years in wholesale in Europe, and he was keeping on telling me, why don't we build the Etsy of wholesale? Uh, I, I am a wholesaler. I see a big opportunity here. You want to build a marketplace. You know marketplaces very well. Why don't we build this together? And so I told him, yeah, OK, uh, let's explore this. Let's meet some people active in this industry today. And he organized three meetings. 
for us. Uh, we met first with a, one uh, procurement uh, person in a department store, one person working for a trade show, and one, one agent uh, representing some brands. And I remember very well these three meetings because we had like nothing to, to show, no, 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 no website, no platform, no slides, just explaining our ideas and uh, what we believe we could change in the wholesale industry. And actually, after these three meetings, the three people that we met, they all proposed us to resign from their job to join us. And so I was really like, wow, this, I, I, I have never seen this. <laughs> there is apparently some big pains to be solved in this industry. And that's really the difficulty when you are exploring new ideas. Like, how do you know that you have product market fit? And here I, I was like, wow, here I know. Because when you say to your friends, your mother, here is my ID, like your mother telling you that your startup ID is good, is not a sign of strong product market fit. Meeting with some people, having worked in an industry for 10 years, and then they want to resign to join you because they believe in the ID, I think this was really key to convince us that we could build a beautiful marketplace in this uh, industry. Interesting. So let's let's talk about the the beginnings actually, and uh, and this is a true story. So we we find this great team, uh, decide to invest. One month later, COVID hits, and obviously you're targeting physical retailers. So you know, big wave of panic. Uh, almost think about you know, shutting down the company. So can you tell us a bit more about you know that defining moment in the company? Yes, yeah, so of course, it was not a great time for our investors, <laughs> us, and also, most importantly, our customers. So indeed, we, I think we, we had launched a platform maybe three months before lockdown started in Europe. And as we had product market fit, we were actually growing quite fast. But in one week, we lost 90% of our business. And so I indeed received at that time many, many phone calls like, sorry, you, you picked the wrong industry. It's shutting down just three months after you launch. What are you going to do? And I'm, I'm actually quite proud with insight um, in, in the decision that we made also with your support, uh, with the support of our investors, because we, 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 I think we did two important things at that time. The first thing is we were providing payment terms, uh, as I was explaining earlier on, and so we had many of our retailers owning us some money. And we knew that they would have to repay us this money during the lockdown, so while they would be shut down. Mm -hmm. And so the first decision that we made the, the day after the lockdown was announced is, okay, we'll postpone the payment. And for us, we were a small company, it was a big deal. But mm -hmm. I think it helped a lot create the trust between us and our community. So quite proud of this decision that we made. And the other decision that we made is we were 10 in the company when COVID hit, but as we had we just raised some money with you guys, we had hired quite a lot, and so we had 20 people that were supposed to join us during the lockdown. So we lose 90% of our business, we triple the size of the team, what do we do here? And so we, we kept everyone, and we refocused the whole company on the brand side of our marketplace. So we said, okay, retailers are closed, but let's focus on the brands. They are like us, they need to reinvent themselves, their customers are closed, so they need to think about new ways to do business. And so we focus the company, we build a great portfolio of brands um, with a lot of energy in the company during these two months. And actually what happened is when shop reopened, they needed to um, replenish their stores. They were looking for new ways of working. All the trade shows which they were using to, uh, they were used to go to, to buy for their stores were canceled. And so actually we exploded after the, the, the COVID, thanks to the choices that we had made during this period. So I think it's a, it, it's a great sign that when a crisis hits, it can actually be a great time for entrepreneurs to make big moves, bold moves, and to create big differences. When everybody is doing well, when there is a lot of cash everywhere, it's difficult to create big differences. Mm -hmm. But when everybody is afraid, that's where you can make these big differences. So, crisis can provide great opportunities and for us, uh, of course, we were not happy about what was happening to our customers, but in the end, it was a great opportunity for Ancostor. Yeah, very, very timely advice. Uh, now, let's, uh, let's talk about scaling. So, you survived the crisis, now you go in hyperscale. And so, when you scale across Europe, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's always painful because different languages, logistics, payment methods, you're hiring people uh, all across Europe. So, how do you think about your 
tackling Europe and you know, did you have a kind of a European first mentality from the start? Yes, so first, this is the complexity of Europe is also our opportunity. As a marketplace, as a tool, we can like, abstract all this complexity, especially for small businesses. Mm -hmm. like, having a lot of complexity is actually an opportunity for tech company. We can abstract this complexity. So uh, we saw this as, a, as an opportunity. And the reason why we decided to be European first for day one, I think that there were three reasons. Because where you're right is like, tackling the complexity of Europe day one, can slow you down. But we did still decided that we needed to do it for three reasons. The first one is we wanted to build something big. And France, as any other European country, I think is too small to build something really significant. So we wanted to be European first. The second reason is, I think, based on our first experience as entrepreneurs uh, with my co-founder, Nico Cohen, at a little market, it took us three years before we went international, and we saw that it was actually very difficult and very costly to make the move at that time, so we wanted to do it day one. And the third reason is DNA. We wanted the DNA of our company to be European rather than French. And, and this is very important because if you start as a French company, you, are, you hire mostly French people, mm -hmm. the language in the company is French, and when you want to like, expand to international talents, it's, it's very difficult for international talents mm -hmm. to strive in that kind of environment. So we wanted day one to hire mostly non-French people, English being the primary language of the company, which is not always the case, unfortunately, in some French company. So that was also, for us, a DNA decision. Okay, so now now you scale, and then we're hitting uh, well, we're hitting a, a second uh, crisis, but more on the on the macro environment this time. Do you have any uh, advice on, you know, how do, how do you manage crisis and and how do you adjust to different uh, macro environments? So yes, indeed, the environment has changed quite a lot in just one year. So I think the first advice and the first first very important thing is to like face reality. Sometimes maybe it can be difficult to understand such a big change in the macro environment, but I think it's very, very important as an entrepreneur to very quickly face reality, understand that, I mean, what you were seeing one year ago will not come back anytime soon. So very, very quickly adapt to this new reality. So in this new macro environment, like financing is much more difficult. So you need to take this into account and mm. so pay a lot of attention to your cash. You want to make sure that you have enough cash to develop your vision. So that's the basics. But then, as I said, crises are, are great uh, and provide great opportunities to make big differences in the market. Our customers, I think they will need us more than ever. Mm. And so we need to be there for them. And so I actually believe that once you have, like, okay, I understand this new reality, I have, made I have made sure that I will survive through this, then let's tackle the opportunities that uh, this crisis will create. As always, crises are enabling amazing companies to be, to be built. And do you have any uh, more advice for you know, entrepreneurs and future entrepreneurs in the room on uh, you know, how to build businesses since you've built you know, two, uh, two successful companies? So. I, I, my first advice, but it's more an advice as a citizen rather than a, as an entrepreneur, but I am a firm believer that a lot of the issues that we are facing as a society, like uh, climate change, uh, like inequalities, all, all, all these issues I think will be solved by entrepreneurs. So my, fir my first advice would be we need entrepreneurs to tackle very big issues like that. Second advice, I already shared it, but that's the most important one. Make sure that you solve big pains, big issues. There is nothing more sad to me than seeing a great team working really hard on a not important problem. And so make sure that you solve a very big pain, a very big issue. Um, and then once you have this, I, th I think what is really important is to surround yourself with uh, amazing talents. Uh, that's what we have done from the very early days of Anchor Store, and it has been amazing to have incredible talents around us, and this is very important in the early days of the, of the company. And then last thing is be bold. Um, be bold. Um, you need, uh, when you are so small as a startup and you want to tackle a big issue, you need to, be, to make bold bets, be very focused, and be bold. Mm -hmm. 
And what, what about people? Because uh, so the, the company actually grew pretty fast from you know, a handful of people to 600 people today. You had to do a lot of hiring. Uh, so for more mature businesses and companies that are going through a hyperscale phase, do you have any advice on you know, how to hire people, how to manage this kind of uh, you know, change in scale? So my first advice about hiring is don't hire if you don't have product market mm. fit. Uh, I think that's a, yeah. a, a big mistake that sometimes people are making, but don't hire if you don't have very strong product market fit, and don't hire if you don't have um, a clear um, um, distribution channels for your product. Mm. But then if you have this, indeed, uh, it can be great to accelerate your business. The way we did it, I think, is as it was our second company, we were very conscious about the need to have very clear operating guidelines for the company. We wanted to make sure that the company was well structured. We know how we wanted to operate. We had like clear operating principles. Um, we had clear guidelines for hiring around the kind of people we were looking for. So we really actually spent a lot of time at the beginning to define this, to make sure that when we would go on a big hiring um, um, work, we would be ready. And the second thing that we did is we build a talent team um, um, very early on uh, to make sure that uh, we would be very professional about how we would go about uh, hiring so that we could provide both a great experience for the candidates, but also so that we could make sure that we would hire the right talents for, for Anchor Store. And do you have uh, any specific thoughts actually about the, the European tech ecosystem? Because you've been you know, an entrepreneur for, for almost 15 years. You've seen you know, different waves of, of companies. And you know, I think European tech is the most exciting place to be at the moment. But do you have any uh, observation of how it's changed over the years? So indeed, it, it has changed quite a lot uh, in, in 15 years. Um, and I think for, for, for a tech ecosystem to thrive, um, you need first some like financing and and uh, for our first company overall we raised two million euros for anchor store we raised more than 350 million euros so like financing i think no is available in europe and so we can build giants out of europe and i think that's a very important condition you need also entrepreneurs with big ambitions and I think, for example, as far as we were concerned for our first company, as I said, we started as a French company. Um, and so I think it's great also to see all the European entrepreneurs willing to build a giants day one. And so this change in mindset is very important. And the third big change, which I think is enabling this European tech ecosystem to thrive finally, is the talents. Um, if you want to build a great company, you need to have the talents um, which who have been through this journey already, so they can, you can learn from them. And here, I think we are still late compared to some other ecosystems. But as more and more big European tech companies are striving, a lot of talents are actually getting the experience that the future European startup will need to scale, because it's actually very difficult to scale uh, a company um, uh, to a very big number, uh, like uh, you know, to a lot of countries with a lo lot of employees, and so experience matters a lot. And so, yeah, having the right talent pool is also very critical. We are still, I think, a bit late in Europe, but like the change in 15 years is uh, is incredible and very promising for the for the future. And uh, just a, a final question. So if I'm, a, if I'm a marketplace entrepreneur today, do you have any specific tips, any specific areas I should target? Yeah, you know, any, uh, any secrets you can share? So yeah, so I, I, I shared a few advice for entrepreneurs in general, and, and, and this, of course, apply to, um, to marketplace entrepreneurs. But for marketplaces specifically, I, I would say there are two other things that are important to me. The first thing is you need to understand very early on on what side of the marketplace you will be constrained. Mm. Will it be more difficult to get the supply or will it be more difficult to get the demand? Mm. So very important to understand this very early on so that you can focus on the side that will be the most difficult to make sure that you will crack it. And the second thing that is important to figure out quite early uh, in the marketplace is uh, about disintermediation. Like how do you make sure that you will not get disintermediate? Mm. Um, and so you need to also figure out this very early on in your journey as an entrepreneur in a marketplace environment to make sure that you will not only build a great marketplace, but also have a, a good business model behind it um, to finance your growth. 
Great. Well, it was uh, it was great to have you, and uh, Thank you, yeah, Thomas. thanks so much for sharing your insights. Thank you, Thomas. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs>